Good morning and welcome to our learning circle. Today's learning circle is going to be on Plains Indian Sign Language and Storytelling with Floyd Favell. Today's conversation is presented in partnership with the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health, and we'd like to thank First Nations Health Authority for generously funding the UBC Learning Circle and allowing us to have these conversations. Before we formally begin, I'd like to acknowledge with respect and gratitude that I'm joining you from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. Please feel free to introduce yourselves and the nation you're calling from in the chat box. Today's learning circle will be exploring Plains Indian Sign Language um, and storytelling with Floyd Favell. I'll ask the, our panelists to introduce themselves in this, just a few moments. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sabrina Squawkin. I'm the Learning Circle Manager. Uh, I'm Seelik Okunagan on my mother's side and Hickory Apache in Belgian on my father's side. Um, I'll be the moderator for today's discussion and joining us today working behind the scenes is Cynthia, our production coordinator, and Kira and Nicole, our production assistants. They'll be in the background interacting with everyone in the chat. Finally, before we get into today's discussion, I'll provide a gentle heads up that the topics may be sensitive or emotionally triggering. Please make sure that you are looking after yourself and at any point you feel that you need to talk to a friend, elder, counselor, or family member, don't hesitate to do so. We have some prompts in the chat for you and if you need additional support. Now we'll turn it over to our panelists to introduce themselves. Well, hi, <clears throat> good morning. I'm gonna give an introduction here, a brief introduction. I'll introduce um, the theme. Thereafter, um, we're going to watch some videos. Some of them, some of the videos are related to what we have been doing here. And some are videos I have taken uh, online as learning tools. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, and then after that, there'll be questions and answers. So like in half hour segments, we'll be talking and I wanna break down uh, the theme, I guess, of what we're talking about here. So as I mentioned, my name is uh, Floyd Favel. I'm a uh, Cree from, um, Cree from Palmaker, Palmaker First Nation, Palmaker Reserve here in Saskatchewan. In Cree, it's called Kiski Komanna. So Kiski Koman, broken knife. It's named because um, there was a Sarsi warrior here, Chotsinna, from the foothills. He came, he came here, and then uh, he brought he brought other so warriors with him. They came to look and they came to steal horses. But then they were caught, and then there was a big fight, and then all those uh, all those Sarsis they. They passed on bravely in battle. Not all of them. There were some survivor scouts who weren't part of that battle, and they made it home. And um, but he had been found sleeping on a hill, tired from journeying, and he was looking with a spyglass. And that hill is what is called Kiskiyakomana Sawapun, Broken Knife Lookout. So Kis. And so therefore this area became, this geographical area became Kiski Komanna, broken knife. So this battle took place around 1840. And then um, our reserve, our chief, he signed a treaty in 1876 when he was part of Red Pheasant Band where he was a counselor. A few years later, he became his own chief of his own band, 1881. And they moved here to Kiskikomanna, this area. So therefore, in Cree, we don't call our reserve Poundmaker, when we don't call it that. We call it, we call ourselves, we call this area Kiskikomanna, broken knife. And we call our, our people here Kiskikomaninwa, broken knife people. So that's our specific tribal terms and uh, so this is where I'm talking from on this webinar. And um, the people of my generation, we talk Cree. Men, most, I would say 90% younger than me, give or take a few years, they, they understand 
but then they no longer talk it. So Cree is no longer a working language of that age group anymore. Because of the loss of language, this is one of my thoughts is, uh, oh, also it must be understood that I started uh, working with Plains Indian Sign Language in the context of theater. I trained and studied in theater in Europe when I was younger, in Denmark and in Italy, across the big water. And um, one of our, one of our, um, one of my investigations as a theater person was to create an indigenous theatrical method that originates from Turtle Island. So it's not a colonial art form that comes here across the big water and comes here to our land and that we practice this colonial art form. I wanted to make it our own indigenous art form. And in order to do that, <clears throat> in order to have your, our own indigenous performance method, you got to work with the existing systems of Turtle Island. And so that's what led me to sign language, looking for a storytelling system, methods, techniques, and tools. But I came upon it accidentally. I first came upon it when I was going to school in, um, in Europe. I came home and I went to a Sundance. And there, there was this old man. He went like this to me. And um, so I went over and uh, I said, so what does that? He said, oh, that's, um, that's um, sign language. I said, oh yeah, can you, can you, do you know it? And he said, yeah, I know sign language. And he started to make different signs. And then as, um, as a as a list as um as a theater person, I was mind you, I was very young, and at 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 that time, um, you don't really have your theories in place. Uh, you can't put them in context. Not everybody, I'm sure. There's other people much more smarter, but for me at that time, I didn't know what to do with that. I just but I just thought there's a possibility here of something. So that always stayed in my mind over the years as I, as I studied and traveled around the world uh, working and studying. And I would watch other people from across the, around the world have their own systems, contemporary theatrical systems. I'm not talking about traditional dancing or traditional singing. I'm talking about contemporary theater methods. And um, so, those two links, European and indigenous. How do you make a system? And so I wanted to create the, in, the indigenous, the European system, put it into an indigenous worldview. And so that was my initial interest in sign language. The second thing was, um, and so, and the second one was my grandmother, she was deaf. So she had to, uh, use signs when we were young. And so in us too, with Cree and then with using signs. And so I already had kind of like a little interest and a little ability and a um, little ability to make some sort of rudimentary signs. And I understood her. One of the main points is sign language is not just signs, it's also eye contact and understanding each other and trust and listening. Because I remember that was how the relationship was with my grandmother. I'd see her, she'd see me, and already we start trying to sense. And then she'd do something, thought, oh, okay. <clears throat> She's getting ready to go to town. She wants to go to town. And then, then she'd go, I guess, like a, Come, now we go together. Like uh, she'd do things like that. And I knew it and I got in the car. Of course, we're going to. So it's the sign language is, I always say, 
it's based on a lot of it, intuition, openness, and trust, and energy. That's what, that's the other root of sign language. Um, now a friend of mine, <clears throat> my brother, Lanny Reelbert, he's on this webinar too. These were the initial thoughts and I didn't know where to go with them because I didn't know anybody who used sign language. And then I came across Mr. Doc, Dr. Lanny Reelbert from the Crow Nation. So he has been coming up um, to our community to teach sign language. And in our workshops with Lanny, um, with Mr. Reelbert, we always, one of our, we always managed to achieve 40 to 60 words, pre, pre words and signs within a four day period. I always make a goal. I always say, we gotta be results oriented. We, uh, so we gotta be able, to, I wanna count how many words and signs people are actually able to make. So that's one of my markers of a success, success or achieving because I didn't want to be having workshops or language camps. People come and, uh, and irresponsibly, I let them come and not learn. I always stress, you have to learn while you're here. You must leave this workshop uh, with a certain amount of words. And that's what the whole purpose of a learning, language learning is. Uh, it's, we have to set goals and uh, achieve it. Some of the statistics that Dr. Reelbert shared with me, um, maybe he'll chat and, and give me the numbers, the exact numbers. But um, Lanny, Dr. Reelbert, I call him my teacher. So he's my teacher. Some of the statistics that he, he says is in the conventional one week language workshops, one week. <clears throat> um, and it would take uh, 56 years to achieve fluency in an indigenous language. <laughs> so, uh, and I would say, okay, using those numbers, if we're able to do 50, 60 words, let's just say 50 mid range. 50 signs in four days. So let's just say <clears throat> it takes about 500 words, 500 words and signs to be able to have conversations. So how many days um, are we talking about there? Uh, four days and at 50 words and then 500 words. Is that 40 days? So that's the numbers we're looking at, maybe 40 days, maybe 30 days to achieve a sort of a fluency in the indigenous language, sign language. Because <clears throat> that's uh, what I, I, I want for um, my community and my participants. I wanna be able to say, I want you to be fluent because we've had workshops now for three years. So 50, 50, 50. So we should be theoretically have 150 words and also be able to engage in conversations. So some people have indicated they're able to have conversations already within those uh, three years, one week at a time. So we try to set goals. <clears throat> The thing about sign language is it's not, it's not, uh, we don't, we're not worried about proper pronunciation or proper structure because the Cree language structure is very different from English in that our words are interchangeable. You can have a sentence, but mix up all the words, it still makes sense. So uh, our language structure is not like the English language system. So that's some of our workshops we've been doing here. There'll, there'll be some videos here. And, um, and, and I guess I give all credit to 
Lanny, Lanny, Mr. Real Bird. And if anybody is interested in uh, pursuing sign language from a master, she would be the one to, to ask and uh, to come to your community or to your specific language to mix your language and sign. Um, most people, when they have come to our workshops, most if not all have said they're able to retain the word and the sign at the same time. <clears throat> so we're talking about, let's just say 40 to 50 words within that four day period, they're able to learn and remember them the next year. Our intent is um, hopefully someday soon, we can make this um, a long, of weeks and months session, maybe a university term of like six weeks. And hopefully we can get that happening here. But we're not credited, we're, a, we're um, an artistic company. We're based here at the Lake, Miyawata Culture Inc. So we're not an educational institution. And I don't mind that. I don't mind people coming learning off the record. The main thing is to learn. Like uh, I'm not really, focused or hung up on trying to be accredited in uh, the white man system. And um, in the Indian system, the main thing is to speak it, to learn it, whatever it takes, however you achieve it through ceremony or through sign language that you can get retain some fluency in your language. <clears throat> um, so that's the basic introduction of uh, of this workshop, of uh, the sign language. Now, storytelling, that's the other thing. <clears throat> Quickly on storytelling. In my researches on creating a theatrical method for indigenous people, my premise, my thesis is that indigenous performance, the root of it is storytelling. So storytelling, that's a, that's a very broad word. What does that mean? <clears throat> First of all, there's different types of stories. But um, I was interested in uh, the technical guidelines of stories. And this is what I managed to identify is um, because in the prairies here in the plains, boreal forest, we have little teepees or little tents. So first thing is, takes place in a confined space. Second thing, audience is close, if not right here. Because that's the second principle. Um, third principle is um, <clears throat> gesture, not, <clears throat> not specifically sign language, not specifically that, but simple gesture when you're talking, gesture, combined with, combined with sign. So gesture and sign while somebody is talking. That's the third one. Fourth one is <clears throat> use of vocal rhythms, unique vocal rhythms as you talk. So for example, in Cree, um, for example, in Cree, Here's one vocal rhythm. For example, when we pray, they immediately go into, because in Cree, we always say there's two ways of talking, normal talking and uh, spiritual talking. Spiritual talking, you've got to light a sweet grass. Um, so in the spiritual talking, they'll use rhythmic ways of speaking or specific ways of speaking. So, um, so for example, when they pray, um, so Lani is making comments. So people feel free to welcome, comment back to Lani. He's the master. So, um, so for example, in Cree, when we pray, we go, Kaptamaganoa kakyoni wakumaganekanuksuta. It's an anak 
So already use of rhythms, vocal rhythms. Um, so that's the fourth principle of storytelling. <clears throat> um, fifth one is, um, is um, um, use of natural light and natural light and fire. So fifth or sixth. Sixth one is um, inter, intergenerational, intergenerationality from young to old. Young to old is the audience and the purpose of storytelling. Now, Lani just mentioned sign language is the active part of language. It is the doing of language. So that's, a, that's, that's how he helps me with his research. I have a colleague, she's from Poland, Sabina Swetasenkotstowska. She's an Odissi dancer, half Bengali, half Polish. You could see her on our website. She takes the movement idea of sign language uh, and takes it into performance and dance. So together, we're working together, her and I and Lani, in creating a theatrical method that's based on storytelling. And um, last week I was in Montreal and I was guest teacher for my friend Emily Monet, um, an Algonquin actress. And we taught the sign language with story and movement and um, it achieved great results which tells me as a method it is working because a method must be able to work for everybody, not just a, a certain group of people. It must be objective. And um, so um, that uh, was a good result of our research. <clears throat> you can see Sabina's performances and presentations on our website, um, miwataculture.com. And um, you could see Lani's sign language videos on our website, miwataculture.com. Lani is on our website as well. And um, that for people who want to learn, within those videos, there's 30 to 40 signs you could actually learn. In your spare time, <clears throat> after you finish uh, the social media, maybe spend some time learning the sign language. And, um, and uh, in the learning, once you learn, we have some place to go from, go from there. So uh, quickly, <clears throat> um, there, we're almost at the half hour. I'm gonna do five minutes of some signs that Lani, Lani taught us with Cree language. And for the people who from different tribes, maybe get the equivalent in um, your, for example, this is, yes, yes, aha uh -huh, in Cree, aha. Uh -huh. um, I don't know what other language um, people, for example, and this is also no, namoya, namoya. See, these are, <clears throat> this is, these are signs. <clears throat> Pictures. Picture is one thing, <clears throat> but all of these signs have a movement. So they all have a movement. And this is uh, developed by Lanny Realbert <clears throat> that he left here. I'm using it. Good. Meosin in Cree. Good. Meosin in Cree. Miyasin. Bad. Mayathan. Bad. Mayathan. Come here. Asam. Go. Nya. Go. Nya. Go. If some of you speak your language, you can start translating. Already that's <clears throat> six words. I know. 
I know, escaped in. Already we make jokes with this. For example, see, to see you, it's good. <clears throat> the respondent goes like this, I know, you know, so already we started to make jokes in sign language <clears throat> after one day. So, um, <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> no, I know. No, I know means I don't know. I don't know. So you could say, what's the weather like next week? You could say, um, I don't know. Who knows, you know? It's a, I don't know. <clears throat> um, sit. Sit. So you could put, come. Sit. So already you're making a little phrase. <clears throat> come, sit. Or some. A bit. It's good to see you. So good to see you. It's good to see you. Huh. So stump, sit. Good to see you. <clears throat> now, as Lanny always does, <clears throat> that's nine words. Let's review. What's this? Yes. Yes. Um, yes, and then? No. Okay. Good. Not good. Yeah. Come here. Go away. I don't know. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> and uh, uh, that one's I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Sit. There, nine. <clears throat> you learned nine in its own language. Sign language is its own language. But also, it's very often connected to speaking. So maybe in your own tribes, if you see people talking, They'll be gesturing too, so it's not it's not just talking and no movement. The other thing, one of the reasons sign language died in our area here, Saskatchewan, <clears throat> is because of residential schools. People didn't want to, our people to be expressive, so they cut out our expression. So people stop moving and expressing. And I just seen a comment about face. Yes, that's important. You're trying to communicate <clears throat> through your face, eyes, and sign. That's it. So that's the other part. Face, sign, <clears throat> and also, so that's the intuition and the trust and openness. And um, let's take a little, okay, let's, the other thing, let, all right, let's do this. Stand up, stand up. Oh, I'll, go, I'll go to these other words, bigger. Um, look, listen. Esquel, woman, man. Open it, open. Like Lanny says, you can use that for starting the conference, like this is a webinar. You could have said to me, Serene, just open it. If you want me, when you want to shut down, you just go like this. 
Let's end it. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> for those of you listening, please listen to Lani Realbird's comments on the chat. Now, Cynthia, I wanted us to quickly to go into our little videos. See this sign? This is, um, I took this picture from the internet. That's White Bull. He was a Cheyenne. Look, he's telling a story of the Battle of Little Bighorn. See his hands? Uh, see his outfit? See his goggles? Next picture. So that's gesture. I took this from the internet. <clears throat> I have the credit. Um, I don't have it on me, but um, I got it from, um, he's a great uh, content guy on uh, the social media. I think tail feathers. But anyways, this picture, you see this old uh, elderly old man? Storytelling and see the proximity of his audience. So that tells us two things, no, three things. Proximity of audience, confined space, intergenerationality, three, three principles of storytelling that one could apply to performance. The other thing, fourth one you could say is a specialized space. By his words, he's turned it into a sacred learning space. Fifth thing is use of natural light. So in this picture is, um, in this picture is, uh, is um, demonstrates those five storytelling principles. Next, um, so that's just, um, this is how I've been breaking down images. Because in order to create methods and theories, you've got to break down, break it down into working principles, something to work with, right? Rather than uh, just um, generic theoretical or beautiful comments. I just thought, what are the technical, what is the architecture that supports storytelling? What is the physical, spatial, and vocal architecture that we are working with that we can apply to theater? So um, I use these principles, start using these principles for my performances. That's part of method. Um, okay, now we're going to some video. Okay, we can watch this. This is our first conference with Lanny Realbird. Thank you. We'll watch it. It's about... The goal of this is to get people interested in Plains Indian Sign Language and to see its value as a learning tool, as a method that uh, is different from conventional methods now being taught in uh, universities and in schools because I don't think um, we can really apply English uh, language rules to our indigenous languages. It's fun to learn and it's interactive it's based on direct communication with people. It's not based on learning numbers or colors or names of animals. Good day. It's good to see you. Plains Indian Sign Language, all the tribes practiced it and maintained it. There's a bit of different dialects, but it was utilized um, when you encountered people who didn't speak the same language as you. They would talk their language if it's Cree and uh, Nakoda, but they would also use signs. The signs was the way to communicate with each other. All it is is just really basic communication. It's not a linguistic type of uh, sophistication of 
the American Sign Language. Sometimes in a ceremony or at Apollo, it's, it's handy. We might see a friend, hey, it's good to see you. Uh, you, know, you come over to my camp and, and, and we'll, we'll drink some coffee. And they understand that when you do that gesture, that we're going to drink some coffee together. We all have a, a somewhat of a a sign language, some, some way or another, maybe we don't recognize it at times, but even just simple things like, hello, that's a sign language, or pointing. So all these little things we do with our hands, our movements, our body, it's telling, you could read somebody to what it is that they want. We're learning Cree and in addition to the signs, so you're learning some practical language and the practical signs tied to that. So it's a pretty strong foundation that we've been learning the past few days. In this type of instruction, or like a Montessori or an immersion approach, they're teaching communication. Over here, in some institutions, they think that the study of language is going to teach, is going to allow people to speak. Well, that doesn't happen. Sure, somebody knows how to say red, but what good is that going to do them? We want this place, this environment to be where there's love and respect, like you're going to an aunt's place or your big sister's place or your grandma's place to where you feel uh, that you're, you're comfortable. Yes, no, fine. A lot of fun, Come, laughing, and go. and learning. And I, I, in fact, I'm not able to say when I'm learning. It's just happening. Like Dr. Um, Real Bird is saying, it's just you, 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 you don't realize when it's happening. It's just happening. So we just follow the movements. We look at him, and we we just pick up those words through our listening. This is very unique that people coming from different backgrounds find that this way of communication is very important for all of us. In that way, I think uh, it's very important, this workshop. And yeah, I'm, I'm extremely happy that I'm, I'm able to be here. Many of the people who took part in this workshop, right now, there are 40 words richer than when they first came. And it's accompanied by sign. And so um, I imagine if if we kept this up for two weeks or three weeks, how many words one would use? And I think actually, if we kept this up for a longer period, it wouldn't be, take us very long to actively start having conversations. I'm looking into the future. I'm not going to just think about myself, but I'm going to think about my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren. That these, what we learned, come together and learn together, that it could be carried on into the next generation. It's like our language, huh? That what we speak, the way we speak. If you lose it, then you lose that. It's kind of like the same way. So for our future, our, our children can carry on. Okay, <clears throat> pause. Pause for a bit, uh, Cynthia. <clears throat> that's, um, <clears throat> that's, um, that was our first workshop we did here on Palm Maker. I would say that's the first workshop in sign language that I know of <clears throat> that ever took place in this country, in this colonial country. And um, where before sign language was very commonly used in our area, but I would say it had died out in our area. But it's not only reviving the language, it's using it as a learning tool to learn the spoken language. Spoken language. Ne next one, next video. Look at this guy, look at his gestures uh, as he tells his story. Appreciate what he's saying. Okay. Then all these, they went up that hill and over, and that's where they met Custer. Custer stopped and looked north and there's Bunch of Indians on the hill. Look this way, and they were standing here. Look this way, and they're standing here. Look back, and it's already coming. Over right there, it started. The Indians had bow and arrow, and the, the militaries, they all got down on their knees and they, in line and they shoot, see? Indians, Indians, they had bow and arrow and a uh, spirit. What they did is they, they just, they didn't stop and do, do the same thing. They just run right up there and 
It's just like a gang fight. See? You knock some down, and spirit some, and they took the own gun and used to kill soldiers with. So on, and wiped them out. So a lot of the Indians got killed there, but they won. So this is why I, I made a talk at a power one time. I said, we didn't attack the United States. The United States attacked us, but we beat them. So that the United States likes to the Sioux Nation, I said. In a talk, I said that <laughs> in the crowd. Okay. <clears throat> See, you know that <clears throat> this elderly gentleman, his um, gestures and signs, and he tells about a battle and his lively movement. So this is um, a lot of our actors can't even be as good as him, you know, a lot of our professional actors in the world. And, uh, but he has a method, he's working within a vocabulary and, a, and a, his Lakota system to tell the story. So I often show that to students and I say, look, this, I'm not just making this up, this, this is how they used to talk a long time ago. Next, next video. This is me and Lanny. All the buffalo were killed and our people began to starve. They wanted the treaty honored. Our people came to this town. They wanted to meet with the Indian agent and that's for food and to honor the treaty. All the town people went to the fort. They thought the Indians were here to make trouble. But the Indians only wanted food. The Indians stayed in town three days waiting to meet the Indian agent. No one came to meet them, and they left the town. And they came back to our reservation. Soldiers came to the town. They wanted to fight the Indians. They went to our reserve to fight us. They wanted to kill us all. An old man woke up early and he saw them. He gave warning. Our people were ready, wondering what would happen. The soldiers came and they fired a cannon. Our warriors began to defend and attack. They fought half the day. Around noontime, the soldiers retreated. They ran back to the fort. As they ran away, the warriors wanted to chase them and kill some more. But our chief, Chief Poundmaker, stopped the warriors and said, that is enough, we have beat them. The soldiers ran back to town. So there, I'm telling the story of um, <clears throat> the battle that took place here on Palmaker when the soldiers attacked us in 1885, May 2nd, and we fought them off. So my great grandfather, he fought there. So I can, I have the right to talk about this battle because those, some of those stories you gotta have be related to those people in order to talk about it. So I can talk about it because my grandfather, great grandfather was there. Notice, he went like this, Lanny. Town. 
white man. This means white man. This white man. This means it can mean a teepee, but in the context of the story, white man town, that means Battleford. So the same signs, it depends also on uh, the con on what the story is about. It'll make sense. So that's what they, that's what they, that's one example. And uh, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's try the next, um, the next video. Now, Maybe Lanny's here. To me, it's not all signs, it's gesture. I knew this old man when I was young and I have permission from his family to use this video. It wasn't on YouTube. So it wasn't publicly shared. They just, um, they showed me their grandfather and I remembered him and I asked him if I could use that video. So I have permission to use this because it wasn't publicly shared. So look at his, movements, his gestures, and maybe Lanny could tell me if it is sign or not. Go ahead. He got southern heaven, white man he got southern heaven. That man up there, he threw me all the way to heaven. I see all the way to heaven. Southern, southern. It's really hard to be good at it. It's really hard. You could go up there, but there's a gate there before you get over there. You want to meet the gate man there. Ask someone. You know, if you don't understand your language, you're Indian, but if you don't understand your language, you talk his language. If you don't understand, oh, you white man, eh? Go back. You don't want white people there. You send the red back. Now, if you're lucky, you find white man heaven. Same thing over there. There's a gate man up there. Before you even come here, I could take to the road. You come that far. Or the hill. Go back, you're Indian. Indians are not allowed here. Now, where are you going to go now? You're going to lock in three doors. Heaven. You're going to lock them. Okay, and there, um, you see in the Lanny's comments, that was my assessment too. It's like very few signs, but some clear signs, but mostly gesture. What I wanted the listeners to remark on is in regards to storytelling. It seems he has a sign for almost every sentence. He has a sign, even words. One word, he'll have a sentence. So he's in a constant fluid movement. So that's another thing is, yeah, movement, but what kind of movement are we looking at when we begin to analyze storytelling, indigenous storytelling? And it would vary from region to region, but there would be some common and shared, shared uh, principles. Now, <clears throat> next uh, video. Um, yes, next one is the late, great Leonard Crow Dog, who's on uh, YouTube. So I felt free to share, to access it and share it because it was publicly shared by his family. I didn't know, I didn't know the man, Crow Dog, but uh, I was watching this video and it shows um, gesture and some sign. Let's have a listen. It's an old fashioned, an old fashioned Lakota way of oratory that he's using. I doubt you will find people speaking like this very often, if ever again, because this old way of speaking is not very common nowadays. Go ahead. Never walk into the good time. Uh, he may make sense. 
when he's saying that, what is happening? Most time of a condition. So I took his education. I took his knowledge, what he just man saying. Besides the spiritual power that is speaking to me, I compare with those comparisons. The identical of the knowledge that can be seen in English, it makes sense. We have of the unborn generation. We have of the elders. We have in what has been taking place. Then we have. That's how I met Russell. And I like the way over over a candy bar called Mr. Goodbar. <laughs> I went to a store and uh, the time Mr. Goodbar was a candy bar was at dinner. This is the way a long time ago. So I went into a, a father named Father Jim Meyer in St. Francis. Good job. Try not to forget that good name, Candy, Mr. Goodbar, Mr. Goodbar, until I got to the door. I wanted Mr. Goodbar, and I gave him a nickel. What do you want, what else do you want, you little dirty Indian? And that hurt me. Then my mind changed. And I saw the American Indian movement, how moved in the mind of the soul. Then I took it. Go ahead. All the things that Russell showed. It's not a great loss. All the knowledge that he showed. All the tribes in the Western Hemisphere. Each family, pure span, should take it and use it. It's going to help you, it's going to help me, it's going to help everybody. That dream, Sunday. And the vision that he talks about, it's putting it into American language. Together. It makes sense. To understand this little child, then he brought to the education. Oh, there you go. Man. Education, so culture would be taught or language. Then he said something there that makes sense to me. Whether you do not speak the Lakota language fluently, but if your mind a Lakota in your tribal way of life, that will bring the unified family. Unified. And that, I look at the altar, and it is me, a word. Wabi Yomi. Ohebo, day. Okay. The co-founder of the dream the yeah. vision of the year. <clears throat> um, so, this was, like Lanier referenced some direct signs he's using. So, but the majority of it is gesture. What I found interesting as, um, yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Lani. Lani is, um, what I found interesting as a storytelling research, once again, every sentence, even one word, how much movement based he is as he talks. <clears throat> so there are more signs that are actual, so that he is constantly in movement as he's presenting, as he's talking. And so that's an old, <clears throat> fashioned way, not only with Lakota, but um, I would say many tribes, was a long time ago, they did use, they accompanied their spoken with 
vocab with gesture and some signs. You can use sign without words. There is some on the internet. You could see them on YouTube. But in these just in these specific videos I picked, I was picking because of my research in storytelling and how it may be you can use it you as listeners, as people participating in webinar. It gives you maybe an example or insight in creating your own indigenous methods based on your own tribes, how to conduct a research. Medicine, yeah. <clears throat> so this is, uh, I guess, a way of analysis, observation of traditional oratory that can be applied to performance that you can apply to your own <clears throat> maybe traditional presentations when you are talking within your tribal group at home, maybe in a big house or in a Sundance or in a peyote meeting, in a sweat lodge, whatever ceremony you're in, you can respectfully. I know a West Coast, they go like this, like gratitude, like haichka, haichka. Like a, I've seen that in, um, in the sign language too. This is thank you. Thank you is, I think it's this, yeah. Thank you. So also you can also acknowledge people like that, but also it can mean, um, it can mean sit back and lay down, <laughs> sit back, make yourself comfortable. Like, can you mean that too? Like how to do it? <clears throat> So there, um, not to belabor the point <clears throat> on Crow Dog's lecture, <clears throat> but I would say um, what you're watching there, um, I don't know if we will see this type of speaking 10, 20 years from now, because you have to have grown up in that Lakota milieu of gesture, lifestyle, and language and worldview. You would have had to grow up like that. And, um, and then it becomes part of you. But not to be discouraging, I would say, well, since we don't grow up like that, <clears throat> we can learn signs. We can learn signs and start using them in our oratory, in our daily life, when we're speaking like at your home, wherever you're from, whenever you have a chance to speak. <clears throat> so, um, man, young man, down low boy, baby or boy. So I was woman, same thing. So he mentioned boy. Leonard, when he was a boy, he went like this, down. You couldn't see his hand. But there he used sign for boy or little. So that was one of his reference for signs as he was talking. Um, with that, um, oh, I don't think I have any more videos I wanted to show. What I wanted to do now is... Um, we are, we're one hour into the seminar. Yes, I will, this last half hour, I wanted people, if they had specific questions. Yeah, we have a few here. Um, do you want me to ask you the first one? Yes. And um, Lanny's here too, and he'll help me answer them too. Okay. This one says, I love to hear uh, how you apply the sign language in your theater practice. It's on my website. You could see it with um, performances by Sabina Swetasen. Mind you, in any theatrical method, it's a process of decades. So the videos you've seen, you will see on my website with Sabina. It's very different from what you would see this year. Within one or two years, it changed. 
So, but you can see some stage of it in uh, um, the website. For example, I was in Japan once, I went to see a Japanese theater master, he created his own method. He had some students from Argentina, they did a performance and I remember thinking, it's not what I was expecting, it's like, um, it's, and I told him that, I said, well, it's not very, it's not what I was expecting. He said, that's where it is now. All method and training is a process of decades, he said. But as long as you have a points of reference that you can do a real research, tools, techniques, methods, as opposed to just words, beautiful words, you know, so. I want to try to see some of these comments. I can't. Uh... Thank you for that. Um, the next question is, um, does it matter what hand you use for doing the sign language? Um, <clears throat> I've never had, I've never heard Lanny say you have to use a certain hand. Unless he wants to correct me. I think he but just I... said any hand was okay. Yeah, I've never heard Lanny tell me, tell us you got to use this hand or that hand. Okay, that's a pretty good question. And um, someone was wondering, what is the sign for spyglass? Well, in that, in broken knife lookout, when broken knife, I went like this. That's a good one. That's what I've seen when elders told that story. Mm -hmm. I've seen elders do that when they told that to me in Cree. Yeah. They, said, they went like this. That's awesome. Yeah. And then our next question is, what is the sign for treaty? Um, Lanyu. Uh, treaty, Tipamatuan in Cree, we say um, I don't know that sign offhand. Oh, grasp both hands the paper motion. Yeah, treaty. Yeah, I think I saw that with um, yeah. them. You've seen that in Crow Dog. Yeah, yeah. we did that. Yeah, treaty. Yeah, that was a good one. And then, um, what are your suggestions for learning if we can't you be with you in person? Um, on our website, for example, Mm -hmm. We have Lanny, he does a lexicon of signs with Cree. That's one way. And the other way, Zoom. Organize Zoom meetings. I myself, I'm not a big fan of Zoom because um, we need that live interaction. That's why I focused on having live seminars with Lanny. I always say, if you really want to learn, you will go someplace and learn. So um, um, if you say you're interested in language, it's important, but don't come, that means you're not really interested, even if it's in your backyard. Like there's a lot of Indians in this area, Battlefords. We have sign language, they don't come. So uh, I always think, I guess you're not really into it because uh, if you're really into it, it's right here. Uh, same way we made the effort to bring Lanny here. Means he really wants to teach it when he comes here. I guess it shows in your effort. Indian way, they always say, you gotta put effort if you really wanna learn. Um, so, um, effort and sacrifice. The other thing you must remember is if you really want to learn, bring some tobacco and maybe a gift. That would be the real way to learn in person. And yes, we could learn in Zoom. That's a good tool too. I'm not uh, saying it doesn't work, but I was applying traditional principles to learning. This is why I wanted it in person. Then you could put the gifts there. But if there's no other way, Zoom is good. Like Lani said, we could organize a Zoom meeting. 
or if there's enough people, like I, I talk a lot with my friend Crystal Wolf from Muskogee. I asked Crystal to come and help me for my next workshop here. And uh, we're still looking for a way to go do it in Alberta, in Muskogee. So we're, we're a small group, people interested. So we're just still looking for a way that we can continue learning by bringing Lanny here. But if it's Zoom, then we will do Zoom. If it's live, we're going to let you know. Thank you for answering that. Um, our next question is, um, do you know how many signs there are for different emotions? Um, we never did emotions. Um, for, um, because the sign is a, is a, is a action word. It's an action storytelling. I have seen this. This uh, man with his wife, they parted. That man, he was crying. <laughs> so I see that. <laughs> That's, that, that happened, yeah. Or else uh, that man, he went hunting. He, sh he shot a deer. His kid, his kid looked you know, sad, cry, you know? So I only know that one. I'm sure there's happy. And, uh, yeah, Lenny just posted some. So he said, hungry, thirsty, nervous, jealous, hate, love, like, and all those can be expressed in signs. Yeah. And there's some for stink. Yes, yeah. That's funny one. Um, we have a few more. Um, how would you say every child matters? Every every child, every child would say matters. Yeah, it's important. Matters. Every child important. Yeah. Thank you for that. And then. Um, can you please let us know uh, more about your camp? Okay, yeah, we're planning it um, um, July, um, July 11th to um, 15th, 2023. I haven't um, told Lanny yet. <laughs> so, but anyways, our festival is uh, July 19th, 20th, 21st. So I'm planning it a few days before that. So it'll be around... Um, around the 14th, 15th of July, here on Pondmaker. Um, if, if your people are interested and in, uh, just come, find a place to camp or live, stay in the museum, pitch up a tent, live at our lake. We have a, we have a lake site here. It's kind of rough camping, um, living in nature, but nowadays that's called land-based. So, uh, so come to our land-based learning within the traditional structures and venues. We built um, a long Ojibwe teaching lodge. That's on our website. Myself and Ken Saddleback, a traditionalist from Muskogee's. We have a, it's about eight feet high, 16 across, 20 wide. That's for learning. Then we also have a structure 32 feet around. Um, that's based on the Hidatsa Earth Lodge, the principle. So that's 12 poles and four in the middle. It all has a spiritual meaning. I think it's important to learn in traditional structures because those traditional architectures are manifestations of our world view. So it facilitates learning and the ground is there and you can smoke pipes in there or smudge. You can have ceremonies in there, but what's important is the structure because it was the great spirit who gave us different structures through spiritual beings that he sent. And then we got these structures. And so I think it's important to revive different structures for learning. I know in BC you have a, you have a 
sort of like longhouse structures and also pit house in Okanagan. I've seen a pit house. And um, I think these structures facilitate learning rather than a conference room in a big city. Because in a conference room in a big city, like some of our elders say, um, yes, Lanny mentioned we can use Cree, Nakoda, and Dakota, but also his language, Cree, for people wanting to learn. But an elder used to tell me when I was his Uskap, I was up north, he used to say, uh, where you get your energy is from nature. Out there, that's where you get your energy. That's where you get your knowledge. He said, uh, rather than a, a city, the type of knowledge you're, you all are seeking, listening in right now, of language, because language is now has a spiritual component. Another elder said, uh, means language, it's rolled into ceremonies. It's part of that. So that's where, uh, and so in order to do that, there must be some, it's good to have ceremonial activity when you're, when you're learning uh, your indigenous language, so uh, structures. And that's what we built here. I spent a few years building here and um, with some hired help and with some grants. I've had some grants, I've applied for grants to build these structures and um, because I wanted to create an alternative learning system. And um, so that's what I've done through my festival and through my workshops with Lanny. I give him all credit for, for bringing uh, the sign language back alive in our area. Um, our next question is, what is the best way to retain and practice the sign language? Attend the workshop. <laughs> and you will get in person and with people 50 to 100 signs. Once you get, once you're exposed to them, you will look at diagrams like this and know how to use the diagram. I think the best way now, in lieu of that, if you can't make it, I understand distance, time, finances, Zoom. You got to get the movement with the with the with the sign. You've seen all those storytellers I presented on videos. Their movement, right? So their movement. So that's the other way. Is uh, storytelling is like uh, Zoom, but live is best and then Zoom. And then you can look at books and learn more on your own. It's also, we've got to understand a lot of learning is based on self-motivation. There's a lot, there's a few books on signs. You look at them, it's like, oh, okay, that's how you do that. Okay, now that you learned the basics, you attended a workshop on Zoom and, um, Lanny is just mentioning he's doing a presentation in Yellowhead Tribal College during the, I don't know when. So that's how I would say is the best way, just to answer that question. I hope that was clear. Learn think, the movement. Yeah, I think you were clear. It yeah. makes sense, like, should it get more comfortable with moving your body and, like, conveying your message? Yeah, and you'll know how that what that picture means. If it's a sign on a mm -hmm. picture, you'll know what it means after. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. And then, why isn't there one universal sign language? There is Plains Indian Sign Language for Turtle Island. That's probably the most universal sign language there is in the world. And I would say it was the most... At that time, this island, in Cree, we don't say Miskinak, Ministik, we don't say Turtle Island, we just say island. In this island, 
that language is universal. And to date, I don't know any universal language in the world, but now English is the most universal. It's run over every language. I watched a documentary on Vox and um, I'm just posting it in the chat right now. Um, but it's, uh, it's called Hand Talk, which is similar to I mean, pretty much the same as um, oh, if who's in it? Is Lanny in it? I I don't know. I haven't yeah. checked that one. I'm pretty sure he's in it. Yeah, it was a good one. Um, yeah. And it was saying that uh, in the movie, it, it was saying that a lot of uh, like ASL um, spoke a lot of indigenous like sign language or, or hand talk and adapt and kind of took it for their own and made it like their own. So, um, because they didn't yes. really have uh, gestures and stuff. I hope um, we must say next time we do something, we must have an ASL interpreter. Yeah, that's a good idea. And then our last question is, is there any sign you wish was in the language? Pardon me? Is there any sign you wish you wished was in the language? Um, no, like uh, me too, I'm, I'm learning and uh, it's a learning experience for me. And um, for me, it's fascinating of the field, like anything, the more you look into something, the more complicated and interesting it gets. So that's how it is for me. Um, a few more you, questions. Okay, yeah. um, sorry for cutting you off. Um, the next question says, um, will I see some sign language when I go see Okinim by Emile Monet? Um, let's see. I seen, I seen that performance you're talking about, whoever is asking. Um, I seen that performance uh, a few weeks ago in Montreal. I just came from there. And Emily is a good friend of mine and a colleague. And um, you'll see gestures, but not specific sign language. So because she's interested in it too, that's why she invited me to her class last week in Montreal. So. You know, I'm not saying you won't see any. I'm not, I don't mean that as a negative. I just mean uh, um, you won't see specific sign language, but you will see a great production and a great story and a great actress. That's so true. The art of um, moving your body with the, the theater probably really helps. Um, and it's cool that you kind of integrated both of them in, into your practice. Yes, um, that's what we're both, we both talk about that creating method. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so our next question is, have you considered doing a tour for the reserve schools to teach the kids? Um, yes, eventually. Um, eventually, once we solidify our summer workshops and solidify a base of learners, then we, we could go to schools. But right now, because uh, Lanny is an expert and we're not experts. So um, it would be pretty hard to keep Lanny here for a long time as he has his home life and his people down in Crow Agency. But, um, so, but for anybody else, um, Lanny gave his contact information and I encourage people Talk to him, ask him, and um, and he's the best teacher for the sign language. And uh, we've all learned a lot from him in, here in our workshops. We have the next question is, are there modern words like Zoom or refrigerator or combinations of existing words, or are there more signs always being created? Like Lanny mentioned, words are always being created. 
Before we had guns, there was no sign for guns. Once the gun came, gun, right? Or else maybe this. So they create gun signs. Coffee, because they grind, this is a sign for coffee. Grinding beans. So <laughs> cooking. It makes you think, aren't if it has something to do with flour and bannock, you know? That's cooking. Fire. Fire, cook, and we eat. So that makes sense, those three, those three big gestures. Go, oh, make the fire. We're already it's kind of an language. ordering language, sign language. Yeah. Like, go do that. Yeah. yeah. And um, where did you learn the six prominent proponents for storytelling? Right. Where? Yeah, where did you learn them? I made them, I created them myself. Oh, okay. That's my own methods, my own, that's my own research I'm sharing. When I teach in universities, well, for example, I'm gonna go teach in Montreal and in Ottawa at Carleton, Montreal at Concordia. I always tell my students, what you're gonna learn here, I said, uh, it doesn't come first, it doesn't come second or third hand, I said, uh, because I invented all my pedagogy, my own research. I always say, if you're going to teach, you got to invent your own thing. Because what, that's why they bring you to teach. You're not there to teach secondhand information or secondhand teaching. You're bringing, you're teaching your own methods. So um, when I teach my students in university, I always tell them, this class we're doing doesn't exist anywhere. Doesn't, nowhere. I said, uh, just here. I said, because I, I made it, I invented it. So that's why I identified those six principles of storytelling. That's awesome. Yeah, it's cool that I feel like that resonates with a lot of like indigenous cultures. It's like um, when you tell a story, you tell it your way, like the way that you remember. And mm -hmm. then um, when you listen to it more from another person, you get different things or it resonates with you at different times in your life. So it's cool to hear. Yeah. That. But I, I'm, I'm teaching them, um, like what I just said, storytelling. I, I teach that now and I tell people, use it. Now create your own way, see what you could do with it. So I try to teach it and um, share it, pass it along with people because we're, we lack contemporary methods based on, based on the past past, long time ago, for the future, yeah. Cool, I'm already picking up a lot of the words. <laughs> um, and then, uh, can you, can American Sign Language understand Cree Sign Language? Um, my friend, um, Crystal is, was here. Um, um, that would have been the one to ask, but the lack there is um, people who are who are deaf, hard of hearing. They've had to learn ASL. It's just like us having to be taught only in English. So they've been coming to the sign language workshops here on Comaker to learn an indigenous language, which is the sign language. And I've seen them integrating it, already using the Plains Indian Sign Language as part of their ASL, and they understand. So when they talk about Lani, for example, they always go like this. Crow Indian. I've seen them when they talk about Lani, they go like this, Crow Indian. So uh, they're, they're different language systems, but 
there's some similar things, naturally similar things like come here, like that, Muslim, come here, uh, sit down. Naturally, things you understand, gestural, but as opposed to the lexicon and the vocabulary, they're different. Even though ASL, a lot of it was Plains Indian Sign Language. And um, we have uh, another question. Um, can you describe how a new word catches on? Um, so for example, I think it's a new, it's a, something new introduced into the society. Um, I think they look for the word, the sign for it. And then um, that's what people use naturally the next time they see each other. I guess it's like a, um, a natural introduction of a, a foreign element that people start using. Like, for example, like I said, coffee and also car. Like even car, like uh, with my grandmother, like, like she should go this way, let's go. Let's go drive, take me. And I say, okay, yes. So car. For example, the steering wheel. Yeah, that's that's a good good one. Um, and then I sent you this one in the chat too, just if you want to read it, but I'll read it out loud uh, first. Um, the person said they noticed the order of nature of the signs and how you use them. Are there indicators for terms like declaratives? and questions future past or is it constru construed through context or body language? Like um, past, like you've seen product go long time ago, right? Long time ago. Future. What? How, like, how are you? How are you? Yeah. So it's um, in the present. You're always talking in the present moment. That's what you're doing. So, uh, for example, you go, what you eat yesterday? So, what you eat? You go like this. Done. Yesterday. Sorry, I thought that was the last question. Another one came in. Um, the person said, can we use your proponents with giving you credit? Uh, what are the signs for a Cree person, a Kota person, Salu, and a uh, Ojibwe? No. We invented a word for Cree people when Lanny was up here in the winter, which is four bodies. Because in Cree, we call ourselves Nehiowak, which derives from Neyowio, four body. So four soul, four soul, four bodied, four everything. So Neo, we yo. Um, for Su, so if your people went like this to you, means what tribe are you? If you're Su, you can go like this. It's like, oh, good. <laughs> it's like, or you could say Cree. It's like, all right, all right, yeah. So, so those are different, there's different signs for different tribes. What's, well, Lani, what's the one for Anishinaabe, Chippewa? Oh, canoe, Chippewa, Anishinaabe. Another question just popped in. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. A lot of questions. Um, 
I'm just trying to find it. Are all indigenous um, in North America, can they all, all understand the sign language? Generally, they do. Yeah, generally they do. There, there's regional variations. Okay, Lani. You think see, we, uh... see you, brother. Lani is heading out. Okay. Um, I think we're done now. Um, Cynthia, do you want to pull up to the next slide? Um, so thank you to all our uh, to our panelists and to everyone for joining us today. Thank you so much, Lloyd, for the amazing discussion. It was great to learn about the six different um, pedagogies and the different ways of like showing us, like teaching us the words and and whatnot. So that was really cool and a little bit of the history of Plains Indian Sign Language. Um, just before we end the webinar, we'd love to bring your attention to our upcoming uh, UBC Learning Circle. Um, we have the Sobriety Circle, uh, sobriety, uh, sobriety and Indigenous Perspective. That is on November 8th at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And then we have Healing Happens Here, Decolonizing Primary Care Through Indigenous land-based health programs in urban spaces with uh, Vancouver Aboriginal Health Society. That's on November 22nd at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And the Warrior Program, that is on November 29th um, at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And then the last one is Empowering Indigenous Subject Matter Experts Through Research with Chris, Dr. Christopher Horsey. And that's on uh, December 6th. Um, at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And um, feel free to sign up for our newsletter. The link will be in the chat. All these webinars are free to sign up for on our website at www.learningcircle.ubc.ca. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at our next Learning Circle. Lim Lim, thank you.